This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It is a different returning to September routines this year, including school and classes. Traditionally, the first Sunday following Labor Day weekend is Gathering Sunday, a time when we kick off a new church year, including Christian education programs and congregational ministries. I want to assure you that the board and congregational leaders have been hard at work putting into place health and safety protocols and practices for a safe re-entry at this time of pandemic. Indeed, next Sunday we will return for in-person worship. While some of us are eager and excited to return, others of us feel hesitant and unsure. Be assured, your decision, whatever it may be, is yours to make and it will be respected. We want to continue to extend grace to one another as we hold our readiness differently. May our hearts be softened and open as we anticipate yet another new beginning and all that God has in store for us. Our worship service will continue to be recorded and they will be shared online. They will be sent out a little bit later on a Sunday than we've become accustomed to, but you can watch for that. As we continue to journey this unprecedented time together, we confess that God is present with us, providing enough hope and wisdom and courage for the living of these days. So welcome to this time of worship. Come, let us worship together. A very special thanks to all those who are participating today, including Dan and Anson, who assisted with parent-child dedication. Let's join together in prayer. God of grace and God of glory, on your people pour your love. As we gather for worship, open our eyes to beauty, tune our hearts to harmony, shape our listening into compassion, deepen our love for you, for one another, and for all of your creation. God of grace and God of glory, grant us wisdom, grant us courage, for the living of these days. Amen. occasion for you. Now, for many reasons, we celebrate the birth of Jane, but also know this is a big, uh, a big transition for you as a family as you anticipate a move. So we're glad that we can be all together today for parent-child dedication. It's good to see both sets of parents and your siblings and all of Jane's little cousins, even Jane's great-grandpa. How good is that? Yeah. yeah, so good to be here. So thanks for having us. Little children in the midst of a congregation and in the midst of a large family circle are a great blessing to us. Simply by being who they are, children remind us of the characteristics of the kingdom of God. Joy and love, trust and spontaneity, warmth, the list of their gifts to us goes on. And the New Testament tells us that Jesus was keen to welcome the little children. 
Jesus made it clear that the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So today we ask God's blessing upon Jane, Elizabeth, Gunther, as we promise each one of us to do a part in her nurture. Josh and Thea, you've been given the opportunity to love and to nurture your three children. Your lives provide the context in which they are nurtured and loved. As a congregation, as family, it's our desire to assist you and to support you. And so we invite you to dedicate Jane to God and to commit yourselves to be faithful parents. So I have two questions for you. We've done this before with Lincoln and Nathan. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago, does it? Do you accept your daughter Jane as a gift from God? And do you accept the trust God places in you for the physical and spiritual care and nurture of your child? We do. And do you dedicate yourself to parents, to love and nurture Jane so that she will know God? Do you dedicate your home, wherever that may be, as a place where you will try to lead your child so she will be able to respond in faith to the love of God through Christ Jesus? We do. We do. We have a response. By the grace of God and with the help of sisters and brothers in faith, we commit ourselves to be faithful parents. We dedicate our child to God. We welcome the assistance of the church in support and nurture. Is this a good time to read the story? Yeah. So I picked this storybook because I love it. Hey! Jane. I wanted you more than you will ever know, so I sent love to follow wherever you go. It's as high as you wish, it's quick as an elf. You'll never outgrow it, it stretches itself. So climb any mountain, climb up to the sky. My love will find you, my love will fly. Make a big splash, go out on a limb. My love will find you, my love can swim. It never gets lost, never fades, never ends. If you're working, if we're playing, we're sitting with friends. You can dance till you're dizzy, paint till you're blue. There's no place, not one, that my love can't find you. And if someday you're lonely, or someday you're sad, or you strike out at baseball, or think you've been bad, just lift up your face, feel the wind in your hair. That's me, my sweet baby, my love is right there. In the green of the grass, in the smell of the sea, in the clouds floating by at the top of the tree, and the sounds crickets make at the end of the day, you are loved, you are loved, you are loved, they all say. My love is so high, so wide and so deep. It's always right there, even when you're asleep. So hold your head high and don't be afraid to march to the front of your own parade. If you're still my small babe or you're all the way grown, my promise to you is you're never alone. You are my angel, my darling, my star, and my love will find you wherever you are. That's beautiful. Such a beautiful story. You do that. <laughs> Good for you. Extended family plays a very special role in the nurture and care of a child. So grandparents, you have a part too. <laughs> We too want to offer support to our children in the task of nurturing our grandchildren at home, in the community, and in the path which Jesus invites each of us to travel. We offer to you our love, our care, and our prayerful support. Josh and Thea have presented their child for dedication and have demonstrated their willingness to provide their child with Christian love and instruction. And they've also indicated that they welcome the participation of the broader Christian family in the nature of the child. So Dan Liebold, on behalf of the Wells and Mennonite Church elders, is providing the congregational response. You have offered your child to the strong and tender care of God and to the nurture of the church. We welcome Jane into our church family. We promise to share in her nurture and well-being, supporting your efforts to provide a loving and caring home for faith in God. Let's pray together. Gracious God, like a mother who nurtures her children, you have cared for us. Like a father, you have called us by name and claimed us as your own. You have loved us into being. 
placed us in human families and blessed us on our journey. By the presence of your spirit, consecrate Jane and her parents in this act of dedication and for their journey together through life along with Lincoln and Nathan. We ask your hand of blessing, protection, grace, and guidance. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now normally, the tradition in our congregation is that this is when I get to carry little ones into the congregation and extend words of blessing. But in, as we practice um, social distancing, perhaps you have a word of blessing you would like to extend. <laughs> I put you all on the spot, haven't I? Go get him, killer. <laughs> Lots of aunts and uncles to spend lots of time together and nurture and love her as she's, she's growing up. So Jane, the God who created you, and Jesus who was sent to redeem you, and God's spirit who dwells within you, may this God watch over you, enabling, enabling you to seek and to find and to know God. God's blessing be yours. She's going to smile. <laughs> Amen. We have something special from the congregation for Jane. Josh and Thea and family are both embarking on a big journey. Uh, and you know show my my and, uh, when Carrie handed me the blanket, I thought, you know uh, how fitting it is that you're joining the military where there's uniform, you know, and in some respects, this is our uniform to give uh, to Jane. To, Rob her and I learn from our, from our population. So as you go three and a half four hours away, we want you to know that, that Jane and you are very much part of our population. So this is a small token of our appreciation. Beautiful. And we continue to hold your family in our prayers as you make this very significant transition. God's blessing be yours. So thanks for having us to join you tonight uh, for this very special occasion. Yeah, there have been a number of occasions spent with your family over yeah. the years, haven't yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah. Your hands. So, uh, a joyous one. So God's blessing be yours. Thank you. from Matthew chapter 18 verses 21 to 35 a story about forgiveness at that point Peter got up the nerve to ask master how many times do I forgive a brother or sister who hurts me seven Jesus replied seven hardly try 70 times seven the kingdom of God is like a king who decided to square accounts with his servants as he got underway, one servant was brought before him who had run up a debt of $100,000. He couldn't pay up. So the king ordered the man, along with his wife, children, and goods, to be auctioned off at the slave market. The poor wretch threw himself at the king's feet and begged, Give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. Touched by his plea, the king let him off, erasing the debt. The servant was no sooner out of the room when he came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him $10. He seized him by the throat and demanded, Pay up now. The poor wretch threw himself down and begged, Give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. But he wouldn't do it. He had him arrested and put him in jail until the debt was paid. When the other servants saw this going on, they were outraged and brought a detailed report to the king. The king summoned the man and said, 
You, evil servant, I forgave your entire debt when you begged me for mercy. Shouldn't you be compelled to be merciful to your fellow servants who ask for mercy? The king was furious and put the screws to the man until he paid back his entire debt. And that's exactly what my Father in heaven is going to do to each one of you who doesn't forgive unconditionally anyone who asks for mercy. These past weeks, as we have been journeying through the Gospel of Matthew, Peter has been a prominent presence. The parable which we just heard is in response to Peter's question to Jesus. If another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? In Matthew's Gospel, Peter's question immediately follows Jesus' teaching concerning restoration and the reconciliation of relationships in the church when a fracture has occurred. We can't be sure about the backstory to Peter's question, but surely we have our own questions related to forgiveness, extending forgiveness, or receiving forgiveness when we have been the one to cause harm. A prominent theologian humbly with honesty acknowledges he finds sermons on forgiveness challenging. Perhaps you do too. And I wonder if that is in part because entering into this shared human experience of extending or receiving forgiveness can expose raw wounds. It can bring to the surface painful memories or experiences, perhaps even scratch off a scab you so believed had healed. What is your experience with forgiveness? Extending forgiveness or receiving forgiveness? Is forgiveness challenging for you? If it is, what makes it challenging? One scholar suggests forgiveness can be a challenge not because we don't think forgiveness is important, but because it is so important and so central, not just to our life of faith, but also to our life of faith together as a community of faith, our life together lived in community, in neighborhoods, and in the world. Consider for a moment, without forgiveness, how could we possibly stay in relationship with one another? Anyone who has embraced the hard work of forgiveness in response to being wronged or betrayed, treated harshly or wrongly accused, knows well that forgiveness does not just restore, it frees the one forgiven. Forgiveness also restores and frees the one who forgives. In this way, freedom and life are at the core of forgiveness. Forgiveness creates possibility. It keeps the future open. It offers paths forward, formerly not even imaginable. It breaks the relentless cycle of revenge and retaliation, opening the way for something new. Forgiveness makes for new life. So Jesus here not only stretches Peter's imagination about forgiveness, he breaks it wide open. Seven times, Peter asks, is that sufficient? Try 77 times, Jesus responds. It's Jesus' way of saying, it's way more than you're thinking, Peter. It's way more than you could imagine or even dream possible. And what likely matters the most, it's way more than you can actually count or keep track of. Because to forgive is to live fully alive and free in the present, which stands in stark contrast to unforgiveness, which keeps us captive to a past that cannot be changed, cannot be undone, cannot be rewritten. Forgiveness is all about new life. Today's parable is a challenging one. A servant of the king owes the monarch 10,000 talents. Well, given a talent's worth is approximately 6,000 denarii and that a day's wage for a daily labor averaged one denarius, the debt load is mammoth. 
far exceeding the national debt of a small country even. In other words, it's a debt load no person could hope to ever repay, even if they lived several lifetimes. It is an outrageous act of generosity and mercy for the king to graciously forgive this unforgivable debt. Enter the scene servant number two, who owned 100 denarii. It's a decent amount of money, but it is minuscule by comparison to the debt forgiven by the king. In a shocking turn of events, the forgiven debtor grabs his fellow servant by the neck and demands money back. There is no mercy shown, only evidence of just how mean and violently human beings can react when we practice indebtedness. When the forgiven servant refuses to extend compassion, it is no wonder that the king becomes angry. He has granted his servant a level of forgiveness that far exceeds imagination. And yet, this same servant is unwilling to offer even the smallest of mercies. We don't know why the servant refuses to forgive the debt owed him. Was he paralyzed by greed? Was he afraid to give up the power he held by virtue of the debt? Was he distracted by the unexpected change that had just taken place in his life? Was he too caught up in his newly privileged status to concern himself with the situation of another? We don't know why he refuses to forgive the debt. What keeps us from offering compassion and mercy to others when we have received so much. Digging into today's parable, it's not difficult for attention to get stuck on the sheer enormity of the first servant's failures. How could this one forgiven so much refuse to forgive another? And yet, each of us probably has struggled to forgive or have failed to notice where we have been forgiven, blessed, or loved beyond what we could imagine deserving and still extend to one another. Scripture tells us in anger that King handed his servant over to be tortured until he would pay his entire death. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. It can be a real challenge to not hear this parable as a stark warning. Forgive or else. When scripture is misused in this way, it comes as a blow. A blow to one's spirit. A blow to the soft places of our heart that scripture should nurture, not harm. K.G. Dusa writes, weaponizing scripture is a sin of the worst kind. Weaponizing scripture is not grounded in God's love and it strikes at the very heart of God. So what is Jesus communicating to us in this parable? Is it a moral lesson? Don't be like that unforgiving servant who was preoccupied by the debts of others that he missed the forgiveness of debt he experienced. Could it be today's parable is actually an, actu an accurate description of just how hard forgiveness is? It is hard to let go of grievances that have left their mark on us and become part of our identity. It is hard to release pain that becomes part of the story we tell ourselves about ourselves or about the one who has harmed us. It is hard to let go of the habit of counting and keeping track, assessing to make sure we're getting what we think we deserve. So what do we do with a passage like this other than to say, don't be like the first servant, you ought to forgive or else? What is it for you to hear today? You have been forgiven and you will be forgiven forgiven for the things you've done 
forgiven for the things that you have left undone. Everything. Always. Theologian David Lowe suggests perhaps the only way to address how hard it is to forgive is to remind each other that we have been and will be forgiven by our gracious God. Jesus taught in parables to show us what God is like, what God desires for us and from us. Jesus' parables almost always include the surprise of grace in ways that jolt us to embrace the life that God offers us. Today's parable includes invitation. The invitation to offer to others what God has offered to us. To be sure, today's parable does not bear responsibility for telling the whole story of forgiveness. Another part of the story comes later, again featuring Peter and the disciples, when Jesus says that the cup he gives the blood of the covenant he pours out with his life is for the forgiveness of sin. Matthew's gospel is the only gospel that includes these particular words of Jesus. They're spoken on the evening when Jesus' disciples will betray, deny, and abandon him. Jesus' words stand as a promise that even when we fail to live into the grace Jesus offers, even when we fall short of extending to others the forgiveness we have received, even then, God is still there forgiving us, loving us, beckoning us into the wide embrace of grace. God is still there, welcoming us home. Standing in that place of God's blessing, our hearts are broken wide open to receive the goodness and the mercy of God. And we are liberated from the constant need to keep score. As members of a peace church tradition, we understand the ultimate way to peace is to forgive debts. Perhaps that's why we pray for forgiveness of debts as we pray for our debtors, when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. When we stand before our God with honest reverence, knowing the depths of grace that we have received from the Lord, our hearts are softened, and that desire grows to give freely what we have been freely given. Wherever you are, in your forgiving process for whatever that peeled away scab has revealed be assured that god's mercy is beyond imagining it is wider and deeper when our own efforts fall short god's mercy and love and forgiveness abounds it's the truth proclaimed by the parable as well as by the testimony of Jesus' own life and ministry. Friends, be assured that new life, new possibilities await the forgiven and the forgiving. For this is the extravagant and generous gift of God who abounds with mercy and forgiveness and grace. Amen.
Let's pray together. Gracious and gentle God, we give thanks for coming to earth in flesh to dwell amongst us and to teach us how to live and how to love. We give you thanks for the power of your love revealed in Jesus. Love that helps and heals when nothing else can. Love that lifts up and liberates when nothing else will. Having been blessed by the power of your love, we want to freely give what we have been freely given. Let your healing love be known this day by all who suffer physically, distress of mind, agony of spirit, or brokenness of relationships. Let your forgiving love be known this day. We ask for forgiveness for harm we have done to one another and to your creation. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Reveal the power of your love and bring new life to all. Let your intimate love be known today, we pray, by all who feel forgotten or lost and all who are walking in the dark valley of despair. We pray for all suffering due to COVID, the sick, the grieving, under-resourced places, and frontline workers. Reveal the power of your love and bring new life to all. Let your fierce love this day redress the wrongs of all who suffer exploitation, injustice, abuse, neglect, or violence. Amidst global Black Lives Matter movement, we pray that the voice of the voiceless be honored and that racism and systems of oppression be dismantled. Reveal the power of your love and bring new life to all. Let your nurturing love today encourage families as a new school year is launched. Grant energy and joy, safety and peace. Let wisdom fill educators and support staff in their important roles. May places of learning, whether it be in person or virtual classrooms, be safe. Let your strengthening love uphold congregational leaders amidst decision-making and rolling out health and safety protocols. Reveal the power of your love and bring new life to all. Let your reconciling love today gather together where divisions are deep. Make your church aware of the fellowship and mission of the one universal body of Christ. Reveal the power of your love and bring new life to all. Thank you for hearing us, loving God. With the whole body of believers, we want to love, praise, and serve you and be transformed by the power of your love, in whose name we pray. Amen. Receive these words of blessing. As you have been forgiven, now go into a world that needs God's forgiving, healing touch. Bring peace and hope to others, sharing God's extravagant love and mercy. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>